Hey, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the conference organizers for just organizing a terrific program. Um, the title of my talk today is Translating HIV AIDS Global Health Research into International Policy, Experiments in Public Health Politics and Advocacy. And like most other speakers uh, that uh, uh, stood up here today, they, uh, many, the genesis of this project, I think, came out of a conversation with Sujil as well. And it was really about this issue of, we have these amazing conversations with people interested in global health and equity. How do we translate those ideas to policymakers, to the general public, and how do we get that message across? I think it's, it's easy for me to convince you, and it's easy for Anamin to convince you, but how do we convince this to the masses? And so I hoped um, after the end of my presentation, uh, we might all have a better appreciation of how to do this. Um, before I start, though, I was trying to think of uh, some words to say, and I was on this beautiful quote by Dr. Khan, who's on the PRHR board member, and it was, Sujal was in all arenas the embodiment of JFK's words. A man whose horizons were never limited by the obvious realities a man who dreamed of things that never were, a man who gave his entire life to the advancement of the right to health. As we mourn a friend who personified audacity in all that he did, our, gener our generation's Jonathan Mann, we must rededicate ourselves a hundredfold to advancing Sujal's dream. To do anything at less would be the gravest of injustices. And I, wow, that's this beautiful quote, and I think it nicely summarizes our friend and colleague's life. So the talk that I'm going to be uh, giving today is focused on HIV, AIDS, and maternal and child health. And I basically pose four questions. So the first question, is global health aid focused on HIV, AIDS a good or bad use of development aid towards improving maternal and child health? Do HIV treatment initiatives distort health priorities, other health priorities, at the expense of other diseases? Is HIV AIDS cost effective vis-a-vis -vis other global health priorities? And more importantly, what is cost effectiveness? Everybody throws that, what does it really mean? And I think a lot of people, unfortunately, think they know what it means, um, but they don't really know what it means. And I hope that we can get to the understanding of what is cost effectiveness. And finally, and what I think is gonna be, um, as we've seen today, I don't even think we have to um, ask or answer this question, can medical students affect U.S. global health policy? I say absolutely, and I think what you'll find from my talk is that actually the sort of players in this particular debate were largely medical students. Um, so let's start. This is our good friend, the keynote speaker, Dr. Uh, Ugeni, at the in 2003 at the State of the Union Address. Uh, 2003 was an interesting year. We did two seminal uh, things in our country. One, we were on the path to, um, to Iraq. Um, and two, we launched probably one of the greatest initiatives in global health called the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. And this really was unveiled at that State of the Union address in January 2003. And uh, the line that I think sums it up was when President Bush declared, I asked the Congress to commit $15 billion over the next five years to turn the tide against AIDS in the most afflicted nations of Africa and the Caribbean. And uh, sort of this decisive moment that uh, is sort of characteristic of the pres uh, President George W. Bush, uh, within four or five months, the law was signed into action. It was called the United States Leadership Act Against HIV, AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. And what's really interesting about this act is um, the tenor in this country, as, as we know, that in the early 2000s or for most of the decade has been somewhat partisan. And the tenor of this particular legislation was very bipartisan. One of the gentlemen uh, at the signing ceremony, this gentleman here with the white hair, is a gentleman by the name of uh, Representative Lantos, who was a Calif California representative. A Holocaust survivor, and he was very, he came together with his colleagues, including our friend Bill Frit, former Senate uh, Majority Leader Bill Frist, who's also a physician, and they really sort of shepherded this, uh, this act, which became the sort of uh, seeds and soil for creating PEPFAR. So as our keynote speaker told us this morning, 
PEPFAR and US bilateral um, and unilateral funds were really the catalyst to sort of uh, bring down the energy of activation in sort of delivering HIV AIDS programs um, to, to Africa and around the world. And as you can see with the advent of the US coming on board with PEPFAR as well as the um, global fund funding, uh, the sort of pace of getting people onto treatment really accelerated. And I think it's, it's notable, we heard this earlier this morning, that the United States does contribute a gr sizable amount of this aid. 51% uh, of total aid for HIV treatment comes from the United States. And I think that uh, it's, a, it's a very important uh, consideration to know that uh, despite what many may think about our foreign policy, we also do have some pretty noble objectives that we all as Americans should feel proud about. Um, outcomes, pretty, I think, very impressive. The numbers speak for themselves. Since 2003, uh, over 2.4 million people have received uh, treatment, predominantly in Africa. I think of, of that uh, number, uh, 10 to 15 percent are children. Um, 340,000 babies have been uh, received, uh, or their mothers rather, received the prevention to mother child transmission, uh, the so called PMTCT intervention that prevents uh, transmission of virus to baby. And we've supported the care and treatment in addition to providing HIV drugs to roughly 11 million people, including 3.6 million vulnerable children. So this is very interesting because many historians are going to look back and sort of, and I think we've, uh, President uh, George W. Bush's uh, memoirs come out about his presidency and he actually devotes a chapter to his sort of legacy in Africa. And I think it's, you know, it's very telling despite what we may or may not think of President Bush. Um, his legacy in Africa is strong. Uh, this is an issue of Vanity Fair where our dear friend Bono guest edited. And uh, Bono, really pay Bono and President Bush were really on the same page on HIV. And uh, this, the other picture is uh, President Bush on a state visit in 2008 in uh, Tanzania. And I think uh, really a hero's uh, persona in uh, some countries in Africa. And uh, it, to me, what's most notable is the last time I was in uh, Ghana, the highway is named after President Bush from the airport to the city. And I think that this uh, speaks volumes to uh, uh, his legacy in Africa vis-a-vis -vis his commitment to PEPFAR. So fast forward a little bit, and we come to uh, 2008, a uh, pretty interesting presidential election in the history books and in global health. Uh, two slogans that I think that many in the HIV community, many in the global health community were pretty, not only were sort of mantras for, President Ob uh, for candidate Obama to take over the presidency, but were also we in the global health field, I think, were pretty excited by some of the ideas that he was saying on the campaign trail. Um, he wanted to commit a billion dollars a year in new money over the next five years, bringing uh, contributions by the United States of 50 billion by 2013. Really uh, taking the sort of uh, seeds that President Bush had started and expanding it. That was Senator Obama as he was getting into the White House. So at the same time, the election was November 5th. A very seminal paper came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association entitled U.S. Health Aid Beyond PEPFAR, the Mother and Child Campaign. The first author is actually a third-year medical student at the University of Chicago. The senior author, Dr. Emmanuel, many of you may know, is um, a very noted bioethicist at the NIH and has gotten, uh, has been somewhat um, made some pretty, I think, controversial statements in addition to global health, but also on this idea of uh, rationing care, this idea of end of life, what are the decisions that we need to make. Not, uh, I think these are very important debates to have, um, and so, but at the same time, obviously very controversial. And I think that this particular paper actually said some pretty interesting things about PEPFAR that we'll talk about. And so they, in this paper, they propose um, some pretty innovative things in the field of global health. I think U.S. global health policy, at least for the last decade, has been pretty much focused on HIV AIDS, um, some would say somewhat myopically. And so they pr propose this theorem called the Principles for International Health Aid, and they basically propose three parts of that. To save the most lives, to save young lives in particular, and to do so using finite resources most effectively. And they wanted to expand this focus from, H from HIV AIDS to resp respiratory illnesses, diarrheal diseases, malaria, TB, 
and maternal and child health. And as you saw from the presentation by, um, by Sandeep earlier today, that there's, there's some rationale. Some of the, many think in the global health field that perhaps the resources committed to HIV are in excess considering some of these other diseases have higher disease burdens. And then the last part of this focus is cost effectiveness. And they make the argument that the diseases listed here are more cost effective to treat and that you could treat more people for the same amount of resources that you might use to treat HIV AIDS. And so this is based on this cost effectiveness argument. This is something that was also touched upon earlier today, uh, sort of looking at these different diseases and putting them on a cost effectiveness ratio. Now this particular figure, this is perhaps a very famous figure, but also has some, some really, some important caveats that we have to think about. This figure looks at cost effectiveness in Africa, and they've basically taken the entire continent, summated all those, and figured out what, you know, apparently here, uh, bed nets for malaria is the most cost effective, whereas treating HIV or diarrheal diseases is um, least cost effective. However, we have to really look at this. If we're talking about Uganda and South Africa that have very high HIV AIDS prevalences, the cost effectiveness ratios tend, would be different if we actually um, stratified this by country and not by continent. And I think that has some important implications that uh, we'll get into um, later in the presentation. More on this issue of cost effectiveness, I think the most important issue that people forget about is that cost effectiveness, and I think Dr. Walensky at Harvard, who's really, I think if you are really interested in this issue of cost effectiveness in global health, you have to read her publication that was published in Clinical Infectious Diseases and a lot of her other work. She's sort of a superstar um, coming up and trying to figure out how cost effectiveness works with HIV and global health initiatives. But she makes a really important point, and that is, Cost effectiveness results become more useful for prioritization purposes only when comparing like populations and like programs. So that means that we can't use cost effectiveness to, uh, to decide global health policy for an entire continent. We have to use cost effective policy for certain settings. So that means in Uganda, it might be more cost effective to treat HIV, whereas in neighboring Rwanda, where HIV AIDS prevalence is less than 3%, it may be more cost effective to treat something else like malaria or TB. So we should try to think about this um, going forward. So getting back to the paper that uh, Ms. Denny and Dr. Emanuel wrote, which was really sort of quite shifting, they made some rather um, controversial statements about PEPFAR. Some of the statements include, yet doubling or tripling PEPFAR's funding is not the best use of international health funding. In focusing so heavily on HIV AIDS treatments, the United States misses huge opportunities, and PEPFAR fails to address many of the developing world's mere serious health threats. So it's interesting. I think that we, just to take a step back um, and look at the chronology of uh, when President Obama came into office to what some of the policies that happened. President Obama was elected on November 4th, a Tuesday. This JAMA commentary by Dr. Emanuel came out on the Wednesday, November 5th. Rahm Emanuel, who became President Obama's chief of staff, was appointed on that Thursday, November 6th. Rahm Emanuel is one of the Emanuel brothers. Um, President Obama was inaugurated on uh, January 21st. Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel was named a senior health advisor to President Obama in February, leaving the NIH to go to the Office of Management and Budget. And then President Obama announces a new global health initiative. Uh, the global health initiative would build upon PEPFAR, but also expand the mandate to treat other global health initiatives. What's interesting about this, though, is when you actually look at the numbers, and we'll get this into later, instead of allocating new monies, monies were redirected from allocations that were previously earmarked by Congress to um, HIV AIDS treatment programs, which caused some problems. So while this debate was unfolding, um, as President Obama was entering his first 180 days, my friend Sarah Leeper and I, Sarah Leeper is a third year medical student at Brown. I'm a second year medical student at the University of Colorado. We were getting concerned. We were seeing that this money that was meant to, to go towards PEPFAR was actually being redirected towards maternal and child health on the auspices of the so-called cost effectiveness. And we were concerned for a couple reasons. One, I think that 
it was going to really change the face that there are waiting lists right now, there are queues of people waiting to start antiretroviral therapy, and if all of a sudden the money that was originally committed to the program was going to be reallocated elsewhere, this would cause problems. And two, observations that we had made, we had both lived in South Africa for two years, was that really HIV AIDS and maternal and child health are the same issue. You can't effectively treat maternal and child health without tackling HIV AIDS, and you can't tackle maternal and child, you can't tackle HIV AIDS without addressing maternal and child health. And so we were interested in exploring this topic, and in our paper we sort of make some points. Um, HIV affects children, mothers, families, and healthcare workers. Antiretroviral therapy, despite what others may think, actually saves lives and is cost-effective in settings where HIV AIDS prevalence are extremely high. And finally, HIV global health initiatives can actually advance and synergistically reinforce maternal and child health and the overall health in, um, healthcare infrastructures of recipient countries. That is to say, in countries where HIV AIDS prevalence is not the most defining disease burden, such as Haiti or Rwanda, where HIV AIDS only comprises 3%, whereas other um, disease burdens, perhaps TB or malaria, are higher, funding HIV AIDS treatment not only reduced HIV AIDS prevalence, but also helped um, reduce prevalence of other diseases because by treating HIV, we then, allowed, we then freed up these hospitals to then start addressing the other um, healthcare um, burden milus of those settings. So we also, at the same time, published a paper in uh, an editorial in Science that talked about these same issues. But this was really frustrating because although we were communicating ideas in the scientific literature, it didn't mean anything. People weren't reading it, policymakers weren't reading it, President Obama wasn't reading it. I don't think those people are sitting around PubMed uh, getting their PubMed updates as some of us may be. And at the same time, a very interesting story, a, a fantastic story, and I'm sure Dr. Magenini can comment on this because I think he was quoted in the article, a story came out in the New York Times on May 9th in 2010 saying, at the front lines, AIDS war is falling apart. And this basically focused on this issue of antiretroviral treatment rationing. These were patients who were um, worked up for antiretrovirals in Uganda, ready to go, but all of a sudden the, um, the, the clinics had to say no because the funding from the U.S. government, uh, from the U.S. Embassy, from um, PEPFAR, they, they were told that no new patients could be started on treatment until um, existing patients either fell off the roster or passed away. But what's surprising about this is that the money had already been committed to HIV. The money should have allowed for additional scale-ups, yet these scale-ups weren't happening. So we fast forward. And we get to uh, July, this past uh, six months ago in Vienna, Austria. It was the um, 18th International AIDS Conference. And something really puzzling was going on. This guy, our friend, our dear friend, President Obama, who won the Nobel Prize in Oslo, all of a sudden was getting beat up on the international stage. I'm not sure if many Americans saw this, but here we have a picture. On this side, we have our good friend, President Bush. On this side, we have our dear friend, President Obama. And the question is, who's better on AIDS? And I think that's a question that we should talk about, and I think I'll let that, I won't editorialize for you, I'll allow you to come to those conclusions. And at the same time, the same movement was saying, broken promises kill. Um, as the keynote speaker told us this earlier in the morning, circa 2008, the G8 countries came together and promised funds towards H HIV, but two years later, those funds weren't being delivered. At the same time, while this AIDS conference was going on, so our friend um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu wrote this really important op-ed while the International AIDS Conference was going on. And the line of the op-ed that I think is significant, having met President Obama, I'm confident that he's a man of conscience who shares my commitment to bringing hope and care to the world's poor, but I'm saddened by his decision to spend less than he had promised to treat AIDS patients in Africa. All of a sudden, these protests in Vienna were being brought home, and I think, um, you know, I think I've heard that uh, President Obama and First Lady Michelle love to read their New York Times before they start their day, and I certainly think they were a bit surprised to be reading this because President Obama, uh, I think, probably believed that his global health initiative was uh, a pretty was going to be very successful. 
On the same day, by serendipity, I had also written an op-ed in the Huffington Post. I'm not uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, so it's a little harder to get into the New York Times, although I've tried many times. Um, and I wrote an op-ed similar to him that uh, basically said in summation that um, confronting illness in isolation, whether by funding PEPFAR at the expense of programs that target maternal and child health or vice versa, cannot be our way forward. We should be advocating for funding both PEPFAR and maternal and child health together instead of favoring one program over another. Just to put it into context, the United States only spent, it's the, I think funding committed towards uh, foreign aid health programs is le 1 percent, less than 1 percent of 1 percent of our total federal budget. So it's really not a whole lot of money. And something really interesting happened. Our, uh, Dr. Manuel, who was attending the International AIDS Conference, wrote back seven hours later in the Huffington Post. I have a feeling he got a phone call from somebody in the White House saying, what's going on? I thought I was the global health president. And it was really cool. He directly responded to uh, Desmond Tutu's op-ed in the Times and mine in the Huffington Post. What made my grandmother very happy was that he called me Dr. Reddy, which was kind of cool. Um, and it was really, it was an interesting um, op-ed with bravado, and I encourage you, I think that I've posted some links on the conference website to read this, because he made some really interesting statements that were, in my opinion, not true, or perhaps the typical Washington, D.C. two-step where you sort of uh, take something and misrepresent it. And specifically, he was making the point that in this op-ed when he responded to us that, oh no, the United States is not decreasing money towards HIV AIDS, but instead has steadily increased support for PEPFAR by proposing an 8% increase in global health funding. Um, this is true, but it's only a misrepresentation um, because the United States had actually committed um, more money that was not being delivered, and specifically, the Congress had authorized a bill that was going to give $9.6 billion a year to PEPFAR, whereas the Obama administration had only committed $8.5 billion, with the remainder of the money uh, going towards maternal and child health. Now, the issue here is not that maternal and child health should be a new priority. Absolutely, it should be. It, it's, it's extremely important. And... Um, it's just that new money should have been um, directed towards maternal and child initiatives as opposed to taking money from something where money was already allocated to and shifting it to new priorities. And the term that I called, uh, he was in fact de facto pitting AIDS funding against other global health priorities. So the lessons from all of this I think are pretty profound. Within seven days of this whole argument taking place in the Huffington Post, seven days later, the Obama administration restored the $366 million uh, to Uganda, and they creatively said it was just a, simply an administrative oversight, that the money was there, but for whatever reasons, got lost in the queue. And this also brought some interesting attention. You had to have, uh, all of a sudden, the world was focusing on these promises that were made that were all of a sudden broken, and we uh, received some pretty noticeable attention in The Guardian and The New York Times and other newspapers from around the world about this issue. I think that just going back on that issue, it sort of showed that I think that, I, I sort of look back on this experience, and I think that had we just stopped at the with the publications in the scientific literature, I'm really not sure anything would have been done. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the, the AIDS activist community is very strong, but at the same time, nothing brings it home unless you have others, such as a Desmond Tutu, writing this and really sort of taking uh, President Obama and holding him to his um, word and, and holding accountability. But more importantly, I think the lesson for all of us here is that it's not enough for us to come together and meet and write and talk we also have to take these messages to the public. And I think that you'll find that it's, it's actually very simple. And I think that, however, in medical school or public health school or whatever stages are we are in our education, we're not taught that yet. We're taught how to write papers for peer-reviewed journals. But we're not taught to, you know, going back to the fourth grade when we were taught how to write a letter to the editor. I think we have to bring that back. And I think that you'll see it's extremely powerful. 
um, future directions that I'm interested in and sort of focusing on, not just from an academic standpoint, but also from uh, um, writing editorials in the sort of lay press is how do we actually fund global health initiatives? It seems like these days uh, global health funding relying on donor governments is going to be really hard. Governments are enacting austerity measures. The money that's available today may not be available tomorrow. And so some of the things that I'm becoming interested in that I wanted to share with you in case there's any interest here and that perhaps we can talk about, a couple of innovative ideas that are just starting to get some traction. Um, one is there are numerous multinational corporations going to Africa, many of them um, mining companies, oil companies, so on and so forth. One company, Anglo-American, is a South African mining corporation, and they've started absolutely a fantastic treatment uh, program for their workers, where they basically have a full-scale HIV treatment programs and um, family-centered care models for their, um, for their miners' families, which I think is something that is really interesting. Another um, sort of potential new revenue stream for global health that's starting to gain traction in Europe um, has gained traction in Europe and is starting to gain traction in the United States is a, something called a financial speculation tax, where they basically enact a 0.005% uh, tax on the untaxed uh, foreign currency derivatives transaction market, which is a $4 trillion market. If you were to enact such a tax, at the most conservative estimates, you would make about $28 billion a year. Not only could you fund global aids and maternal and child health, you could also fund uh, global warming initiatives, so on and so forth. So that's, I think, something we need to think about. And then finally, the last issue that we've all sort of uh, touched about is using the sort of traction and the success that we've had in HIV AIDS treatments programs and sort of recapitulating that success to look at other disease burdens. Um, I, finally, I'd like to uh, close with I think Sujol's legacy is pretty self-evident, um, this through hearing the lectures today and the interactions that all of us have had with him. And I think that he really embodies, you know, I think every great culture and religion has some term, whether it's in Judaism, tikkun olam, which means repair the world, uh, himsa in uh, Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, he is really this, this personality, and I think that what I find interesting is despite not knowing any of you until today, hanging out and getting coffee, we instantly became friends. And I think that that is the connection. I think that's the, the social network that uh, Sujol envisioned. And I'm really, it's pretty thrilling and exciting to actually see that come about today. And I think that all of these ideas that I've talked about are not even my ideas. They've just all come about through interacting with others. And I think that like anything in life, a good conversation can just change your life. And I think that we have to continue having more of these conversations. Um, one of the quotes that I really love um, is, uh, is from Sujol himself, where he says, there are, many ways for, there are many ways for us to work together and even more reasons for doing so. And the social network, we're not talking about our friends at Facebook or Justin Timberlake, but really the social network, that's what global health is. If you really, I'm sure if we wanted to look at a history of this movement, and all the greats, whether it's Dr. Medenini in uh, Uganda, when he was talking to his fellow doctors in the 90s about, look at this epidemic that we're seeing, or whether it's in the early 80s with our friends uh, Paul Farmer and uh, Jim Kim and, in, and, uh, at Harvard just talking about these issues over the cadaver and anatomy lab, or the conversations that we're having today and we'll have this afternoon and tonight. There's this incredible potential, but it, and it comes about at the intersection of conversation and innovation and ideas, and I think that clearly we're all tapping into that. Um, and then an important point that I'd like to share with you, my mentors, and I think that when we talk about anything in, uh, anything really in life, but also in global health, in order to get from the stage that we are at to the next stage, we need great mentors. And I, I actually went to the University of Michigan for undergrad, and I was a history major, and David William Cohen was my professor, Catherine Burns was a visiting professor from South Africa, and I'm going to say this very emphatically, the University of Michigan is the greatest university in the world. I don't care. I think the beauty of Michigan, unlike other schools, is that you have a medical school next to the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, next to public health, next to nursing, next to kinesiology, so on and so forth. 
But what that actually allows compared to other campuses from across the world or across the nation is that you can actually have these real conversations. You can go to Pizza House over a chapati and talk to an economist, a, a public health worker, and an MD and sort of bring in these three disparate fields and come about and have a very interesting perspective. And that's the perspective that I arrived at being a history major, all of a sudden figuring out that maybe I'm interested in medicine. The next person is a guy by the name of Hussein Kavadia, who's probably one of the most famous scientists in the field of prevention of mother-to-child transmission in Durban, South Africa. These three doctors were my mentors at McCord Hospital, which is one of the largest PEPFAR-funded clinics in um, Africa. And then finally, another mentor is, by, is a name by the name of Michael Weinstein, who's the president of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, an, an advocacy group. And what this sort of shows you is that what I like this picture is that you've got some historians, you've got some clinicians, you've got an advocate, and you've got a scientist, clinician, researcher all coming together in the same goal. And I think that's really the strength in, when we sort of talk about how do we recapitulate these lessons to other global health disease burdens. HIV AIDS, AIDS is interesting because you've got the academics working on solutions, but then you've got these advocates who are holding governments accountable. And that's what we need to translate to other disease burdens. We need people who have type 2 diabetes who come out and say, who start protesting and literally say, look, we're not going to put up with soft drinks in our schools. We're going to march and we're going to write letters and we're going to change policy. And I think that those are the lessons from HIV AIDS that should be extended not only to other uh, disease burdens, but really to other things. I think the art of advocacy is, is being lost in um, the United States and much of the world. And I think that we need to really bring it back. And so with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks for a very inspiring presentation. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah, just a comment on cost effectiveness and the various diseases that you mentioned, uh, in the end, you did come to, to the real issue. I treat AIDS, and I treat many AIDS cases than most physicians. But in the course of treating AIDS, I actually treat all of those diseases. Right. So the moment you start doing cost effectiveness, uh, then you don't know that the malaria is more susceptible. I mean, people are more susceptible to malaria because of AIDS. The diarrheal diseases you are talking about, most, virtually all of them might be due to AIDS. They have, uh, because of decreased immunity, people would otherwise not get it. And you can go across the whole list. Uh, most of these uh, cost effectiveness that I saw in the defense of uh, trying, or in the defense of uh, funding other programs instead of AIDS was just a, a justification of a situation that was not always uh, correct. Right. You got uh, what I believe in correctly. We have challenges with many other health issues. Global Health Initiative is a great one, but it really does need new money. I think that's this is simply an excellent point. I think, if, as you said, you're